Hi, one before the last chapter. How excited you are to be almost done with ANP1. Um, I'm excited. Um, and I'm also excited because I love this chapter. I think it's one of my favorite chapters from this book. I think it's super interesting. So we're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system. And as always, let's start with our learning objectives. So we're going to define the autonomic nervous system, um, talk about the anatomy and a little bit of the physiology when it comes to the neurotransmitters between the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches, difference between pre- and post-ganglionic neurons, roles of the sympathetic nervous system and the effect in organs, the role of the parasympathetic, the site of origin for both, and length of fibers, and what is sympathetic parasympathetic tone, what is localized versus diffused effects. Okay, so let's start by defining the difference uh, between parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So this picture is showing you somebody resting and digesting, right? He just had a meal, he's super full, and all he's doing here is digesting his meal with a full belly. And then on the other side, you have a guy that haven't, hasn't eaten in some time, and all he's doing here is running from a snake. I like to say running from the lion in the dark. That's usually the example I use for sympathetic, and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. So that's the system that you call fight or flight. So you usually have a predominance of one of these two, not necessarily like a black and white thing where it's just one or the other. You have shades of gray here, okay? You can have a sympathetic predominant activity, but still some parasympathetic um, actions happening for you to keep your homeostasis, okay? So it is a dynamic balance, and it doesn't mean it's all to one side or all to the other side. Of course, in some extreme situations, you're going to see that super sympathetic response versus, you know, and very little parasympathetic. But a lot of times you have shades of gray. So the autonomic nervous system is mostly or fully um, controlled by smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, and glands. So glands secrete smooth muscle contracts, cardiac muscle contracts. So are all this motor activities or sensory activities, would you think? So we are in the motor division, right? And if you're in the motor division here, you see autonomic. This is the part, and the, the motor division is divided into somatic and autonomic, and somatic is the skeletal muscle. What would you call the autonomic? The visceral, so the visceral motor system. So this is the somatic, uh, uh, the somatic motor system, and here is the visceral motor system. It's another name for the autonomic nervous system. Okay. Just open my things here. Um, so this picture is a picture that is like a lot of what you need to know is in this picture. So what do we have here? This first part is the somatic nervous system. What is the somatic nervous system? Motor neurons that come from the spinal cord down to connect it to something um, upstream of the spinal cord that enervate skeletal muscle. You see your skeletal muscle here? So what is this? This is a heavily myelinated axon from these neurons that run inside these nerves as motor fibers and when they reach the target organ, the effector or target organ, which is the skeletal muscle, the only thing they know how to do is secrete acetylcholine. Okay? That's somatic nervous system. 
always, so these two are all motor systems, right? They are sending an action potentials to induce an activity, some type of activity. You're not sensing anything here. This is already the response, okay? So the difference between what I just told you, which is the somatic versus the autonomic here, is that autonomic is first divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. In both cases, you have an, a ganglion. And you may be like, wow, you said that ganglion uh, is ganglia, right, plural, is usually present when you have uh, sensory neurons, the unipolar neurons. That's the, not the only situation. That is true that it, the dorsal uh, roots of your spinal cord, you're going to see those ganglia for sensory information. But also in the autonomic nervous system, you have ganglia. Why is this called ganglia? Remember, ganglia is any accumulation of soma or cell bodies and dendrites, of course, in the peripheral nervous system. So look, cell body, out, this is all, see, this here is central nervous system. This here, peripheral nervous system. So you know that this is a ganglion because you're in the peripheral nervous system here. Look, peripheral nervous system. So one thing that differs between somatic and autonomic here is you have two neurons. Because you have two neurons, you have a site for um, synapse, which is the ganglion. The first neuron is usually, or almost always, lightly myelinated, and the second or postganglionic neuron is not myelinated. In the sympathetic arch or branch, you have acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is always being released by any preganglionic neuron. So preganglionic, preganglionic, and preganglionic release acetylcholine. Postganglionic and postganglionic. If you're sympathetic, you release norepinephrine in most of the cases. There is one exception. Parasympathetic, you release acetylcholine. Okay, so this is the difference. Sympathetic, preganglionic acetylcholine. Postganglionic, the signal is sent by neuro, uh, norepinephrine or epinephrine. And in the parasympathetic, the second signal from the postganglionic neuron is also release of acetylcholine, okay? You can also, instead of having a postganglionic neuron, have a direct synapsis between the preganglionic neuron and the adrenal medulla. What is that? Remember the adrenal gland on top of your kidneys? I said they're the little hats for the kidney. Um... The medulla of the adrenal gland produces what? Epinephrine and norepinephrine. These two hormones travel through the blood and have a lot of sympathetic actions in your body. So either you release acetylcholine, sorry, epinephrine and norepinephrine directly from the adrenal medulla or from postganglionic neurons, uh, depending on the situation. But you always have noradrenaline and adrenaline causing, adrenaline and epinephrine is the same thing. So you always have them triggering sympathetic events. And then target organs. Do you agree that what you're seeing here are all either smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or glands? Remember, these are the effectors for autonomic nervous system. And this, the, the, this stimulation for these organs can be stimulatory or inhibitory and you may say oh I think I know this stimulatory sympathetic and inhibitory inhibitory is parasympathetic no not at all it depends on what you're talking about some situations depending on the organ you're gonna have increase in the parasympathetic and decrease in the sympathetic so it's not positive for one negative for the other it will be a case to case by case uh, type of situation, okay? Okay, so 
let's look at one more thing that I want to tell you before I show you. Um, yeah, let me give you these tips. So one thing that is important is that most of your um, visceral organs have dual innervation. What is dual innervation? Innervation by parasympathetic and sympathetic. One is stimulating, one is inhibiting, depending on the organ. So we're going to talk about that. It's going to be really easy to infer and uh, get do a correct educated guess for most of the organs. There are a few exceptions that you're like, wow, this is sympathetic. I had no idea. But then we'll talk about those, okay? Um, let me give you a general scenario so you understand what is the role of the parasympathetic division. We have this is this division referred as rest and digest system. So think about a person relaxing and reading after a meal. What happens inside this person's body? Blood pressure is not going to be high. It's going to be normal, close to lower pressure compared to the other system. Slow heart rate and slow respiratory rate. Gastrointestinal tract activity is high. You're digesting. Your pupils are constricted in your eyes. Why? Because you're just in a relaxing situation reading something from close. So your lenses bulge to accommodate for close vision. They're not going to be stretched. They're going to be bulgy, right? Um, your your pupils are constricted because you don't need so much light. You have enough room light. So you don't need to open so much the pupil to let so much eye to your retina. So the pupils can constrict, okay? And you have the opposite happen in the sympathetic division. So you have E, think about the sympathetic division, the division for the E's, E for exercise, excitement, emergency, and embarrassment. All these situations are related to sympathetic division. So when you look at this and you think about a person um, having increased heart rate, right? Think about all the situations with the E's. Dry mouth, cold and sweaty skin, dilated pupils. That's why I say that my example is you're running from the lion in the dark. Because when you're in the dark, you, you remember that you're going to dilate your pupil. So you let all the possible light from that dark, uh, dark environment so you can see it, right? You can see it, it meaning the lion, right? Um, during vigorous physical activity, what happens, which is related to sympathetic, right? Exercise. <laughs> You close the blood vessels, uh, sorry, you open the blood vessels to skeletal muscle and heart. You constrict blood vessels to your skin and digestive system. You dilate the bronchioles, right? Make sense? You need more air. You're running. You're doing some exercise. And you release glucose that is stored in the liver. The same way, so is this all the opposite for the parasympathetic? Yes. So in the parasympathetic, you have vasodilation in the skin and digestive system, vasoconstriction in the skeletal muscle, because you're not doing activity. You don't need a lot of blood to your skeletal muscle. You have um, formation of glu uh, glu uh, sorry, glycogen. So you increase the insulin, which will lead you to store um, glucose. And you um, constrict the bronchioles. You don't need so much air in your bronchioles when you're just resting and digesting in your lungs, right? You're not in need of oxygen. So you can constrict what allows more or less air, one of the things, to your lungs is the constriction and relaxation of the smooth muscle of the bronchioles. So in this case, parasympathetic constriction.